Hello, I'm Sa Jung Wook, and I run a small dental office in Korea. Nice to meet you. Before the COVID 19 pandemic, I shared in a DO webinar that I was happily running my dental office since I implemented digital treatment systems. I wonder if since that time, many other dentists have implemented this digital method in their dental treatments and are enjoying their lives at their dental offices. Since then, I have been doing all my treatments digitally, without taking any analog impressions except for making dentures. Today, I would like to talk about the topic of treating patients who have blood-related diseases and are taking thrombolytic medication or aspirin for diseases such as high blood pressure. Patients taking thrombolytic drugs may have hemostatic issues. So, it can feel more burdensome for the patients themselves and the doctors. So, I want to talk about how much the guided surgeries relieve that burden for the patients and the doctors by sharing some of the cases that I worked on. This first patient is currently using partial dentures because only five incisors are left in the anterior maxilla. This patient wants to stop using the partial denture by getting an implant. But the patient was taking thrombolytic medication, so we plan for the surgery after the patient stops taking it for about five to seven days. The treatment plan, in summary, was to place three implants in the second quadrant and then to connect them with a pontic. Then, place two more in the first quadrant for number 14 and number 16. Now, it is more standard to place it in the number 3 position. But a lot of the bones in the distal area have been absorbed, as I'll show you in a CT image later. I'll also show you the planning on Implant Studio later too. Regardless, there are some surgical concerns for this patient. Normally, we can do GBR where the bone has been absorbed and then place an implant. But the patient wanted a simpler method of surgery that caused less damage to the patient. So, we plan to place three implants here and then to use a pontic for number three. This wasn't the initial plan that I came up with. I told the patient in the beginning that we will place an implant on number three. But when I designed the treatment digitally, I learned that there isn't as much bone in this location as I had thought. So I changed the treatment plan. I do this often. So there is no need to carry out difficult surgeries. I prefer to avoid the maxillary sinus area, so digital dentistry is very useful for that as well. It can be used like this when planning implant treatment. Of course, there may be some controversy over it, but I have done this many times, and although I do not have long-term data yet, there haven't been any big problems. So, for example, if the tooth in this position had bad bones, I would have seen it ahead of time and planned for the implant surgery to avoid that position. If I had discussed with the patient to place two implants, then I would have used a pontic here. But in fact, the bones in the first quadrant were in good condition. The number four position was good, so it was better to do it this way, especially since we have to place two implants. 
So I make plans like this first. And on the day of the surgery, since there are no incisions, there won't be much bleeding either. So we plan to proceed with surgery on both sides at the same time after the patient paused their medication. Then we took a scan. So the treatment plan was made for five implants like this with the patient. And we received the RPD data for the two pontics. Since the mandible had up to number 6, the plan was to restore up to number 6 in the maxilla as well. For those with RPD, some may have natural teeth left, but typically, it's mostly dental prosthesis. When we take CT in this condition, well, those who have done guided surgeries may know well, but I will explain one more time. So, in fact, we know that in guided surgery, pre-steps like taking scans and CTs are very important, but we oftentimes neglect these steps. In particular, for scan data, since the guide is placed on top of the entire tooth for surgery, it has to fit correctly in order to place the implant exactly where I want to place. I always say that the scan data and CT have to be taken accurately. It's the same as cooking. The raw material needs to be good for the cooked meal to be good. When acquiring CT and scan data, it is good to get into the habit of paying attention to obtain accurate data. As a basic principle, the common denominator of CT and scan data is the teeth. But in most cases of replacing RPD with implants, there are missing teeth like this. So in the end, it's as if there are no teeth. So I place markers here. I use a blue resin like this. There is the white plastic marker provided by Dio as well. But that uses histoacryl to attach and it's more difficult to attach than you think. So I just use a normal resin like this. I use blue so that it can be distinguished by color when it's combined later. The blue resin stays on the gum well if you blow air and dry it well. It stays on the prosthesis well like this too. I can give you a tip. In the beginning, I took the scan first, then attached a marker, and then scanned again. But the marker would often fall off. The marker doesn't attach very securely. So now what I do is, I scan before attaching the marker. And on the screen, I erase the position where I place the marker using the trim function. Then I attach the marker and re-scan that position again with the marker. Then the time for taking the scan shortens. And if you take the CT as soon as you finish the re-scan, then you can minimize the time the marker stays inside the mouth, which in turn minimizes the chances of the marker falling off. That's the method I use now. So I do a whole scan first, and then I place the marker inside the mouth. I erase the position with the marker with the trim function, and rescan the same position, and then take the CT right after. And I check it while the patient is waiting and proceed. So, where do you place the marker? It's the position closest to where you want to place the implant. Area of surgery, whether it's number 3, 5, 6, or number 4, 5, 6, make sure to put one here. It's better to put it in the back, as close to the location of the implant, rather than putting it here. For here and here, 
You can just put one if you are sure it will come out clearly. But in case this marker falls off, or in case this one can be seen, but not this one can't, I safely placed four markers. But when you actually combine it, I use only three markers. So, after the scan and CT, the patient can leave. Then, I start with implant planning in implant studio. Yes, as I planned earlier, there are three for number four, five, six, and in the second quadrant here, and the pontic is planned for here. For the first quadrant, number four and number six and bridge here. And if you look at the bone, this here is number 26. For the bone, there's some cortical bone, but I remember that the bone density was about D3 or D4 in the bones. It's even worse here. When I first designated this area, I positioned it as number 3, but it's actually in the number 4 position. Next, it's the same here. Here, you can't even really see the cortical bone well. For cases like this, when you do the design, you can move the data like this so that you can see the location of the maxillary sinus a little more clearly. Anyway, this case was one where the bone density wasn't that great. So, check the antagonistic relationship with the mandible as well. The width here isn't as wide as expected. It's because the RPD went in like this and it's slightly a deep bite. Also, since a blood-related disease exists, incisions need to be avoided as much as possible. So, when you are working in implant studio, check these things well too. You need to see if the drilling location is on the attached gingiva or the mucosal. Of course, if there isn't enough gingiva, then you might have to make an incision regardless. Thankfully, this patient's treatment was all on the maxilla and the implants could be placed on the attached gingiva and not the mucosal. It may seem trivial, but it is important in order to minimize incisions. Because we put a lot of effort even after surgery to secure the attached gingiva. In cases with blood diseases, it's more difficult to secure the gingiva on the mandible. When we are designing, we often mainly look at the implant location, but the big advantage of digital surgery is that you can see which part of the soft tissue is going to be pierced. So, review one more time the implant location and look carefully where the soft tissue gets pierced. I will show you a video of the surgery later so you can see how accurately it works. So once implant planning is done, then you design the guide. Since the guide will be located only on the five incisors here, it is necessary to cover the palatal as much as possible when designing the guide. So, when you are taking the scan, you can't just scan the area you will be placing the implant here and here. You need to scan the palatal as much as possible so you can position the guide stably and the guide will stay in its place better during surgery as well. Sometimes we place anchors to fix the guide in its place. For the maxilla, the trick is to use a palatal well. So, I consider this even from the scanning stage. The guide can't be made just by scanning the surgical area. It won't be able to hold on. So, design the guide to include as much of the palatal as possible so that the guide can be positioned stably. 
That is, since patients with RPD mostly have missing teeth, it is much more advantageous to scan so that the palatal is clearly visible. After the guide design, you print it out with a 3D printer. Now, I'm going to show you parts of the surgery. The guide has already been placed. As I mentioned, since it goes on only five incisors, the holding tension is not that good. Since the palatal is for retention, it only takes on the support role of a stable location. Yes, so it is good to check the position of the palatal and give the attached gingiva through a mirror while the guide is placed. It is advantageous in several ways to check if it really is the attached gingiva. Then carry out tissue punch. I don't really use the bone flattening drill often, especially when the bone density is D3. D4, like in this case, there is a chance that even the cortical bone might be removed, so I don't use the bone flattening drill. So, I put on a tube and start with 2.0 drill. If you look, it's a little difficult until it penetrates the cortical bone and then it goes in smoothly. In guided surgery, you can check the bone quality while drilling like that. It gets easier to tell if you gain more experience. I always take measures like this to prevent bone heating. Even now, if you look at it, the guide covers only the five anterior teeth, which doesn't have much undercut, so the guide comes off easily without much retention. In that case, place the guide on the roof of the mouth and hold it with your hand like that and drill to avoid shaking. That's a very important part. Looks like I'm drilling the final length. If you watch the drill go in, it goes in very easily. For me, with D3 and D4 bones, I drill up to a diameter of 2.7 based on the DO kit. So instead of underdrilling one step less, I underdrill a lot. In my experience, even when you underdrill a lot, the implant still goes in all the way. At times, I can't achieve the initial stability even when underdrilling to 2.7. So, I often had to change the original implant diameter from 5.0 to 5.5. Every time you drill, be sure to irrigate with saline to avoid bone heating. So, if you look now, this is a profile drill now, and I only use up to 3.8. For me, I finish the final drill at 2.7, and then with the profile drill, I use up to 3.8 just in case the implant doesn't go in if the hole is too small. You need to pay attention like this each time. If you look, there is barely any bleeding. 
당연히 그 가이드 수술을 하면서 이렇게 Guided surgery is a very advantageous surgical method for those taking medicine related to hemostasis. Right before I place the implant, I use a curette like this to cut out the soft tissue residue. I find soft tissue inside the hole more times than I expect. When the bone quality is poor, what appears black on the CT is due to the actual low bone density, but it could also be because there is soft tissue inside. There are cases where there is still some remaining inflammation. If you scratch it too hard, it could be bad for the implant fixation, so it should be done gently. The reason I am poking like this is to check if it's soft tissue and not the bone, because this can cause implant failure. Yes, that's why I try to poke around with an explorer once in a while to check that. I don't do it all the time. Now, the remaining tissues have been cleaned out, and I checked overall that they were all bones. Now we place the implant. Like I said earlier, I completely under-drilled for drilling. Yes. The implant goes in all the way even though it was under-drilled. Finishing up and placing the next implant. It's actually very convenient. Compared to making an incision and checking with the eyes for the implant location while the flap is open, in this way, you just need to place it where you already perfectly designed digitally. This video is about 22 minutes and I don't remember exactly, but the surgery didn't go over one hour. Though the video is 20-something minutes, the actual duration of the surgery was more than that. But I didn't edit this video much. It definitely didn't go over one hour. There are five implants, and as you can see, the implants rotate slightly. The implant is slightly tight as it goes in. It is much more advantageous if the implant goes in like that and is a little firmer. Instead of under-drilling by just one step before, you can do the final drilling up to 2.7 since the implant will go in most of the time. For the maxilla, there is barely any bleeding after implant placement. And for this patient, the bone quality was very poor. I only use DO as UV implant for all of my surgeries. Even for the maxilla, if the bone quality is good, then the initial stability comes out to be over 75 when measured with IDX in just one month. But for those with poor bone quality, I wait three months to give it plenty of time. I'm connecting a cover screw here instead of healing abutment as usual because... This patient wished to use his RPD he has been wearing. Since the patient can't eat with just anterior teeth for three months, so this is what I do. There are many people like this. They really appreciate being able to use the denture they have been using. It still heals well with a cover screw. Problems like food parts getting stuck in the surgical area do not occur. So I just cover it with a cover screw and finish the surgery. For the opposite side, I use tissue punch as well. In this case, you can proceed after fixing the fix pin of the opposite implant and further stabilize the guide. But this is done assuming that the implant is inserted firmly. 
When the bone quality is poor, like in this case, don't connect the fixed pin. If I can see that the guide is stable to a certain level, then I don't connect it. After the tissue punch, I connect a tube as I did on the other side. I'm usually right-handed. But since I perform a lot of guided surgeries, I'm able to use my left hand pretty well too. So, if you look, I'm drilling with my left hand. The teeth in the second quadrant had worse bone quality than those in the first quadrant. Or not? I think it was very similar and almost all the drilling finished in one go. You need to irrigate during drilling to prevent bone heating. If you look at the first quadrant, there is almost no bleeding. If the bone quality is strong and you're using the initial drill, it is important to increase the drill length step by step from 5 mm to 7 mm and so on. But since the bone quality is very poor, I pierce through the cortical bone first and then use the final length drill for the rest. I think this is the 2.7 drill. Then, I think this is the 3.8 profile drill. Irrigation and then the 3.8 drill again. I'm not sure if I did one more step. I usually use a 3.8 drill next. As I explained before, I always check the hole with a curate before the final drilling and implant placement. I'm checking to see if there is any soft tissue left. Yes, this was also under-drilled and the implant was placed right away. I don't think I edited this video that much. So, I think the total surgery time was about 30 minutes. Since I didn't drill that much, it shortened the operation time. Yes, this is the placement of number 24 implant. If you look, the guide is loose. To add tension, I fix it to the palatal with my hand and proceed with the surgery. This is the implant placement in number 25, and lastly, in number 26. Now, I finish with a ratchet. I think the bone quality is okay here due to the under-drilling. Now, all the implants are placed. In the same way, I place only a cover screw, and the patient goes home wearing the RPD she has been using. Like this, I place the implants and fasten a cover screw and leave it as is. For me or clinicians who perform many implant surgeries, this may not seem like a big deal since we do it all the time. But if we made an incision in this case, then the patient can't eat food until the stitches. And when they put on their RPD, it will feel uncomfortable for a while. But in my surgery, 
there was only tissue punching and the rest of the gum were left as is, so it can be used again right away. It might not make a big difference from the dentist's point of view, but it's a big difference for the patients. So, I've shown you the surgery in a video. Yes, as you saw in the video, the maxillary sinus was left just right. The surgery went well and I finished with the placement of the cover screw only. When I think about it again, if I didn't use guided surgery but use the analog method, I don't know if I could have finished both sides in 30 minutes. And if I diagnosed it using just an x-ray, the treatment plan would have been different. Since I carried out the planning in this way, I was able to know that the bone quality was poor on this side and that the implant shouldn't be inserted here. If I didn't use guided surgery, I'm sure I would have placed the implant here. I would have made an incision, placed the implant, did GBR and grafting, and had a very difficult surgery. And then, if inflammation continued here, then the implant could be affected. I was able to avoid this location and plan to place the implant in a better location because it was done digitally. I was able to finish with just the cover screw because I didn't make any incisions. The patient was very happy. Because the patient was able to eat right away after the surgery on the same day with his denture. So the surgery finished like this. If I show you each image one by one, you can look at number 16 here. It's cloudy on the CT image. I did the planning like this by avoiding the maxillary sinus. Yes, this is number 25. Next is number 26. The maxillary sinus is just avoided here as well. This is the number 24 tooth. I took the CT to look at the tooth and to see how much of the bone on this side melted. So, it's been about a month since the surgery here. In three months, it's the same as before. The patient just has implants placed underneath his denture. The patient continues to use the denture he has been using. After three months, the patient is going to pause the thrombolytic medication. Then, I only need to punch the top tissues covering the implants using the original guide that was used. I'll punch tissues to quickly find the surgical location and scan by connecting the healing scan body. The patient won't be using the denture for that one week with the scan bodies connected while we fabricate the prosthesis. For us, it takes about five days to a week, so during this time only, the patient can't use the denture. But if the patient absolutely has to wear the denture during this time, then I just need to scan by connecting the scan body. Then I'm going to connect a cover screw here while the prosthesis is being made and have the patient not take the medication on the day the prosthesis goes in. It's possible, but I would discuss it with the patient and strongly advise not to use it for five days to one week. Since they have to stop their medication, they will likely listen. Of course, if the patient requests something else, it can be done differently. Anyway, we are doing it like this and the patient is currently waiting. So, this was a male patient with RPD who was on thrombolytic drugs and this is how I treated his case. Now, this is the second case. This patient still has some remaining natural teeth. Likewise, this patient got dentures recently but has several indications. For one, the patient is taking thrombolytic drugs and is 75 years old.
So the patient is old and taking thrombolytic drugs. Also, the patient got their denture recently, but they weren't able to use it because it's been causing severe gagging. So, this patient was in a situation where implant was the only option. So, the patient came to our office and the red marks here indicate the consultation I had with the patient at the time. So here, up to number 6 here, and up to number 7 here. And the maxillary sinus is here like this. So, if we do bone grafting, then number 4, 5 to 6. Might be difficult for number 7, but to do it for number 4, 5 and 6, bone grafting is necessary in the maxillary sinus. But the patient is 75 years old and taking medication, so the circumstances are not ideal for surgery. But the patient is having a lot of difficulties eating. But to do bone grafting in the maxillary sinus, then lifting the maxillary sinus and waiting for a long time for recovery wasn't what the patient wanted either. They wanted something more simple. So I explained in the beginning. I said we can do a procedure in the maxillary sinus and place implants up to here so that they can chew food. But the patient didn't feel at ease and wanted the most simple method that wouldn't cause any major inconvenience. The patient said they just could not use the denture. Since the patient is older at age 75, what I suggested was to place just two implants on number 4 and 5, here and here. Just two implants, because having implants up to number 5 will definitely make chewing easier than now. So instead of going up to number 6, I suggest to do it this way. Using the digital method, I will try not to touch the maxillary sinus and place it in the already existing bone as much as possible. After I explained, the patient agreed with my proposal. So, the patient and I settled on this treatment plan and I began the planning. Let's take a look at this picture. I did the planning to avoid the maxillary sinus in the front and for it to fit just right in the back. I put it very close so that it looked like the implant was placed just on the cortical. In fact, the space here isn't very big. Looking here, when you go in roughly, it's narrow here. It's the same here. There's only enough space if the two are very close to each other. Here, the plan I made before was green. It's orange here because I set the minimum distance to 2 millimeters in the implant studio and when the implants are closer than 2 millimeters, the color changes automatically to warn you. Also, just to note, in the older version, if the distance was that close, it didn't let you proceed to the next step. But the new version allows you to use your own judgment. Even though the distance becomes close, there's a function where I can adjust the distance manually. Anyway, the color is orange here because the distance is closer than the recommended distance. It means it's that close. So, for this patient, as I mentioned, we did the planning this way considering the patient's requirements. If you look here, this is number 25. This patient has better bone quality than in the previous case, but it's also not that good. But we are able to plan the fixtures to fit just right. Yes, if you take a look at number 4 here, it's very close, like what you saw before for number 4 and 5. Looking at number 5, it does look like it's touching here, but if you look from here, it doesn't actually touch the maxillary sinus. So on CT, it looks like it's touching the maxillary sinus, but it actually isn't touching it. Next is number 14. Number 15 is only slightly touching the cortical bone as well. So, I designed it to be simple so there won't be any trouble during surgery. So, now this isn't a video. I'll show you just the results. It looks like it's touching the canine because this is a panoramic image, but it actually isn't touching it. If you look at the planning from before, 
it was placed in just the right location from the canine, so there is sufficient distance there. Since two implants need to be placed in that space for this patient, I had to put it as close as possible. So in the panoramic view, it looks like they overlap, but in reality, they did not overlap. Looking here, as I had planned, the implants were placed well just by lightly piercing the cortical bone. This patient, likewise, waited three months for recovery. Since then, the patient came in recently for the initial stability test and all the results were over ISQ 75 and 80, showing very strong fixation. So we took a CT scan for the prosthesis. In the first case, it wasn't to this stage yet as the patient was still waiting. This patient in this video will get the prosthesis set in two days. If you take a look here, the scan came out good. Yes. I don't use any other implants, but 100% only use DOUV implants. I make all the prostheses by using the DO scan bodies. So this patient's surgery finished very well. Since the patient was old, I was worried about the bone, but the fixation came out to be much higher than I expected. It was very convenient. Actually, the space was narrow, especially areas like here. I'll delete this a bit later, but the VD here isn't very high. But because of the strong fixation, the patient will be able to live without using dentures as they had hoped. The surgery, like the previous case, only used tissue punching. Since this patient couldn't wear dentures at all, I just connected the scan body. So when the patient comes in two days later, I will put in the prosthesis. In this lecture, I shared two cases with patients who had blood diseases. The surgery for this patient also didn't go over one hour. So the patient received the surgery comfortably without worry. I shared about cases that showed how to proceed with treatments for patients with blood-related diseases. So, this digital dentistry is being used a lot in various cases. In particular, when it's used for patients with difficult circumstances for surgery, it enables comfortable treatment for both the dentist and the patient in many ways. I think it's a big part of having a happy dental life that I talked about last time. I'll finish the lecture here. Thank you.